Just off the coast of North Florida lies an underwater world teeming with life. Hi, I'm Joe Kistel, and unfortunately most people are unaware of this fact, so we felt it was important to create this program. The region is home to marine habitats that benefit the offshore environment as well as the community. These habitats include natural live bottom areas consisting of rock formations as well as structures that were purposely placed offshore. Both the natural rock and the structures placed offshore are encrusted with invertebrate life, things like corals and sponges, and these organisms provide resources that support the overall marine food chain. This show is a series of conservation stories featuring how marine habitat is created, how those same habitats need to be maintained, and how a pesky invasive species is being dealt with. Marine life is no stranger to the waters offshore North Florida. A great diversity of fish and invertebrate growth are found at natural hardbottom reef areas, but surprisingly, some of the highest congregations of sea life are found at habitat sites that started with less than natural beginnings. Over the last several decades, it has become common to purposely sink structures to create habitat. The process is referred to as artificial reefing. These structures evolve into productive habitat, benefiting the environment and offshore enthusiasts. North Florida is home to a seemingly countless amount of artificial reef sites. Reef deployment started as far back as the 1960s and the amount and types of structures found offshore today is bewildering. This story is going to discuss the process of modern North Florida reef habitat creation projects, including the deployment of a metal ship and recycled concrete material. In 2009, a retired non-functional Coast Guard vessel known as a spike, was decided a good candidate to create marine habitat offshore Jacksonville, Florida. It was determined its metal structure would be ideal reef material, but prior to sinking the vessel, it would have to be prepared to an environmentally friendly state. This involved removing anything non-metal and environmentally non-friendly, which included items such as electrical components, insulation, and general debris. Even though our end game was to sink this vessel, we ironically had to make some repairs to ensure the vessel would stay afloat long enough to reach the intended sinking location. Once the spike was completely prepared, she was placed into the water and began her voyage offshore. Her destination was 28 miles offshore at a federally permitted reef zone known as Arms Ledge. Once on site, she was anchored in position, seacocks were open, and she slowly sank below the ocean surface. She landed upright on the ocean floor, 110 feet below. Now, sinking ships is not the only way to create habitat. Since 2009, four large-scale reefs have been created offshore the coast of Ponte Vedra Beach using entirely recycled concrete material. Prior to each one of these deployment projects, the sites selected to place the reef materials were surveyed by investigative divers to make sure the locations were suitable. The two big variables of consideration were confirming adequate depth and that no existing reef habitat was present in the vicinity. We had to make sure the reefs would meet navigational clearance requirements and we did not want to damage any natural reef habitats if any existed. For each project, nearly 1,000 tons of has-been concrete was accumulated. The recycled material included culvert pipes, foundation footers, and a variety of pre-used concrete structures. The materials were loaded onto a barge, one piece at a time, using heavy equipment. The loaded project barge would then be slowly transported to the predetermined reef location roughly 20 miles southeast of the Jacksonville Inlet and just 12 miles east from the nearest beach. Once arriving at the precise location, 
heavy concrete anchors would be dropped to secure the barge in position. The material would then be offloaded piece by piece into the ocean until the entire barge was clear. After each one of these deployments, divers would descend 70 feet to the sea floor and survey the layout of the reef materials. These reefs were designed to lay within one half mile of each other in a diamond formation. This configuration makes these habitats conveniently accessible to the recreational boater. The most recent deployment, known as the John C. Leone Memorial Reef, included the placement of a life-size statue of Jesus at the beginning edge of the reef. It has been over five years since the vessel's spike was intentionally scuttled. The sunken tender has completely transformed into an underwater oasis teeming with life. Nearly every inch of the structure is covered with encrusting organisms, and these very life forms are providing resources for great diversity of marine life. The four concrete reefs have been offshore for various periods of time, with the oldest having been deployed shortly after the spike in 2009. These piles of waste concrete have already evolved into marine life hotspots teeming with activity. Concrete material is somewhat similar in makeup to natural limestone, and in this region, exposed areas of limestone make up our natural reef systems. Habitat areas that have been created with concrete materials generally contain the same animals that are found on regional natural reef habitats. Taking a look at other artificial reefs in the region suggests that our newly placed structures will continue to evolve over time. These reefs will become more diverse in marine life with age. It is astonishing that thriving ecosystems can be created in this manner. Materials are placed in deemed appropriate areas and then Mother Nature takes over and creates luscious ecosystems. It is a win-win scenario where waste materials are utilized to create areas that not only benefit the environment, but also create offshore recreational destinations. Today we're taking a group of marine conservation divers offshore Jacksonville, Florida to perform a reef cleanup. In our group today, we're gonna to visit three different artificial reef sites, roughly within the 10 to 15 mile range of the coast. And the reason we're gonna visit these sites is that they're relatively close to shore, meaning that they get a lot of traffic. These are the sites that fishermen tend to visit because logistically, they're easy to access. They're relatively close to shore, they're relatively shallow. The sites we plan to visit have the most debris left from human use. So we're gonna probably find a lot of fishing line, a lot of anchor rope, and fishing line is, is, is the one of great concern. You see, fishing line is generally monofilament based, which means it doesn't biodegrade and it's clear. So what it creates is a very nasty entanglement hazard and basically all types of marine life can get hung up in monofilament fishing line. The adventure begins at daybreak where the Diamond Dimer vessel awaits her conservation divers. And while still dockside, divers prepare their equipment for the reef cleaning efforts ahead. All aboard, the team begins their trip offshore. Once on site, divers suit up in their dive gear and prepare to enter the ocean for the first cleaning dive of the day. Down below, divers find a sunken barge artificial reef that has been on the seafloor for nearly 30 years. At first, the barge seems as it should, with a healthy population of encrusting organisms, but it does not take long for divers to find the items they came looking for. Within minutes, my dive partner finds the end of a rope that leads us to a giant pile in an anchor. 
We do our best to place the rope in our trash harvesting bag and cut the anchor free. The rope completely fills our bag. Other dive teams were busy removing monofilament fishing line from the reef structure and reef growth. The divers worked together, one using specially scissors and snips to cut the line free, while the other held the bag for the waste items to be placed in. Divers worked delicately, almost as if they were underwater surgeons, when attempting to remove the line entangled in live coral colonies. So we just came back up from our first dive on a barge at MR, and it's a load of fishing line, anchor line, all kinds of stuff. Actually, after our dive, we cleaned it up pretty well, but there's still more down there. But um, I think we did a pretty good job. Beautiful, beautiful dive. We killed that. Do you see? Huh? We killed that. We did. <laughs> um, a lot of, lot of debris, of course. We found a nice, a uh, couple nice anchors, a lot of uh, line, um, fishing line. Uh, rope, and we brought up a big chunk of rope. Cause that bag got full really quick. You that one chunk that hit it, you like, I was like, oh, so much rope. Good time. Found a bunch of chains, rope, pulled it up, packed it up. She was my back carrier, so it was a little heavy. Just a little bit. But she toughed it out, she did excellent. Uh, gear is about 60 feet down. I want to clean just a tad bit more. Alright, so here we go dive two. We're at the school bus bars. We're going to go clean up the reef. Divers descend below to another sunken barge reef, similar in underwater age to the first site. Visibility conditions improved, allowing divers a better opportunity to target clear monofilament line. As in the previous dive, the teams worked together, one cutting the line and the other holding the waste bag. Along with the cleaning efforts, the divers were treated to underwater wildlife encounters. A giant southern stinger was found resting in the middle section of the barge. She wore a coat of sand camouflage, but it was not enough to keep us from spotting her. A female nurse shark was also spotted in the framing of the reef structure. Encountering such animals in the very reef environments we are cleaning reminds us of the importance of these habitats and why maintenance efforts like these are so important. Woo-wee! It's like kind of diving. That was fun. A lot of water. <laughs> hey, a big old barracuda swimming around down there. A lot of fish in line. Didn't find much rope this time. A lot of fishing line. Here. Good cleanup. So that was another barge we dove, another artificial reef that's relatively close to shore. And um, just like all the other ones, it's it's full of fishing line. So we tried to bring up what we could. And we're running out of space. This stuff we return back to the fishermen. Yeah, good as new. Good as new. What we're doing is, when we brought up a lot of this stuff, we've got a little bit of growth on it here and there, and instead of sacrificing it, what we're going to do is we're going to take it to the Marine Museum in, in Jacksonville University, and they're going to put it in their display aquarium, so it should stay alive and, and work well from an educational standpoint. So stuff like this, this is live coral. We're going to try to save it.
Well, the stuff never bowed to grapes. It sits there forever. Some of the coral and everything will attach to it and begin to grow. The bad thing is it just sits there and it floats around some of the fish will eat it and it'll entangle some of the turtles and stuff that swim around here and it's not good for them. We just have groups like ours going in here on a regular basis. You know, we probably won't clean everything up, but we'll make a dent in it. It's a great day, beautiful weather. Everybody's fantastic out there, did a great job. They really did their part today. But again, we only visited a few reefs today and the fact that we brought several miles of line and anchor rope just goes to show you that there's a lot more work that has to be done. In this region alone, there's several hundred reefs offshore. This encourages us to do more cleanup efforts like this down the road. We're hopeful we can do as much as we can and we hope we encourage other groups to do the same thing. Just off the coast lies a fish with an impressive physique. Those who see it for the first time are amazed by its elegant and mesmerizing fin display. And although it's hard to argue their beauty, there is one problem. These fish are not supposed to be here. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific, which is about as far away from here on Earth as you can get. A measly few lionfish from the aquarium market made it into local waterways a few decades ago. Today, they are here off North Florida, as well as throughout the Western Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And they are here not only as a few isolated individuals, but in plague-like congregations. Lionfish are considered Florida's most prolific marine invasive species. It's likely that the invasion started sometime in the mid-1980s. That's when the first reported sighting was of lionfish, just north of Miami. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of North Florida. I work in fisheries biology, and one of my uh, subjects of expertise is invasive species. Well, lionfish really are sort of the perfect storm. Uh, I think in many ways, as invasive species goes, they have a lot of characteristics which make them very successful in, in the invaded range. They are habitat generalists. They reproduce very early in life. They grow very rapidly. They're capable of dispersing uh, large distances during their egg and larval phase. So you've got an animal that's easily adapted to a lot of things, has novel ways of hunting prey. Animals are herding and spitting water jets and things that native animals have never seen before. Most evidence suggests that relatively few things that can eat them do eat them. All of those things sort of put together mean that it's a species that, that's able to succeed. You have an animal that can, once it invades, um, can really increase in population numbers very rapidly. They're eating a whole variety of, of our native species, and so you're going to see impacts potentially on multiple levels. Um, for one, they're removing prey that would have been available for many of our native fish stocks. Um, they're also certainly having a direct predatory impact on many of those small reef fishes. And while we don't fish for those species, those species perform important ecological services on the reef. Uh, many of them are uh, herbivorous fish that maintain uh, algal crops at low density. Uh, many of these other species are cleaner species, so many of the shrimps and gobies and things. Uh, perform services by removing parasites from some of the larger fish. So removing those, um, those species can have an impact. Lionfish are eating many things and they're voracious consumers. They can drive down densities of these fish species very rapidly on these reefs. Today, a team of conservation divers are heading offshore to capture lionfish. Their goal, to remove as many of the invaders as their safe underwater dive times will allow. I'm going out lionfish bashing. I'm gonna catch them with a pole spear. I've got a pole spear and I'm going to put them in a zookeeper and, you know, get as many as I possibly can. There's a lot on the bottom, I understand. They are really bad. They're bad for all the reefs. They're eating our little fish. Well, the, the little fish that become big fish, they're eating our grouper. They're eating everything. They're, they're a disaster on our reef system. Uh, we just, we need to get them rid of as many as possible. The targeted hunting grounds consist of natural and artificial reefs 20 to 30 miles off the coast. These sites are the preferred habitats of lionfish. As expected, there are no shortage of lionfish below, and divers go to work. The majority use a pole spear, 
as it has proven to be the most effective way to maximize harvest yields. A few divers attempt a live capture, but the technique quickly confirms to be an inefficient harvest method. Back aboard the vessel, hunters fillet a few of the harvested lionfish to prepare fresh ceviche, a tasty benefit from a day's worth of productive work. Once ashore, we decided to take a closer look at the day's catch. Okay, so what are we doing here, Mary Kate, with this big old fish? Okay, so the first thing that I usually do is take the length. So total length is going to be all the way to the end of the tail. And on this fish, it is about 366 millimeters. This one is about 700 grams. We're gonna actually go ahead and, and open this up and see what's in the gut content of the fish itself to get an idea of the type of fish it's eating here. Mainly we're looking to see if it's a boy or a girl and what's in the stomach, so that's how you do it right here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take out the stomach. We've went ahead, we've, we've looked at what was inside the stomach. That was this thing here. It's pretty gnarly. Um, we found out it was a male. Here are some boy parts. And we also <laughs> opened the head and found the otoliths, which are the ear bones. And I suppose a lot of research can be determined from Yeah, people the use otoliths for all different kinds of things, not just aging. But. And so now we're left with the meat, which is actually really good. So we'll fillet this up and uh, make a few sandwiches out of it. Today was a lionfish removal tournament event where several boats full of divers were offshore harvesting. And the tournament has been a great success in educating the public, getting people to come out and learn about lionfish, to try some lionfish for the first time. It's a really exciting event to be a part of. At the day's end ceremony, all the lionfish were reviewed and categorized. Prizes were awarded for the participants who removed the most lionfish. The lionfish captured that were not consumed were donated for research. 276 total length and 184 standard length. Our research program on lionfish here in sort of northeastern Florida is trying to characterize a lot of the life history traits uh, of lionfish. So we're looking at things like how fast do they grow, uh, how many times do they reproduce, how many eggs do they produce. We're looking at trophic impacts, so by that I mean diet, so what these animals are eating. So we bring the fish back to the laboratory, we take out the stomach and we identify the prey items that are, that are found within so we can get an idea of what these fish are eating and how it changes seasonally. It smells wonderful. It's like the eyeball, cornea maybe or something, hard to say. Um, but obviously here's some fish skin. You can see why many of the items we get are not readily identifiable by eye. So looking at the size, that fish was probably at least three or four inches when it was eaten. And this fish is close to 12, maybe 13 inches. So lionfish can take in prey almost half their body size. Uh, we remove their otoliths, which are ear bones. They tell us a lot about the age of the fish, so similar to tree rings. They're like the black box in, a, in an airplane. They record sort of the life history of the fish, and so there's a huge amount of, of information contained within those biological samples. So we've fully processed this fish. We've taken its measurements, its length, and its weight, and we've taken a variety of biological samples. We've removed uh, the otoliths from the cranial cavity, from their position just behind the brain. Uh, we've opened this fish up to uh, look inside. Here were the, the prey contents here, so uh, one larger fish, not visually identifiable, we'll send this guy off to the Smithsonian lab where they'll give us a positive identification on species. Uh, we've removed uh, the gonads, this is a female fish, uh, so these are the ovaries uh, filled, uh, filled with eggs. Uh, and we've taken a fillet sample uh, from um, the dorsal left side of the fillet for use in our mercury analyses. I think right now the best strategy we have for controlling the fish is human consumption. So if we can increase um, the amount harvested uh, through a variety of ways, uh, increase demand for this species in both seafood markets, increase uh, demand in terms of restaurants to get restaurants to carry it, then I think things start to fall into place. So if the public 
can ask for it, can demand it. It's a delicious fish, then uh, the restaurants will carry it, and uh, they'll have, the fishermen will. If there's a market for it, they'll they'll go out and get it. So there you have it, just a few examples of offshore conservation efforts underway. I hope you enjoyed watching and that this helps shed some light on the significance of healthy environments. I ask we all be mindful in minimizing the footprints we leave behind and consider taking an active role in conservation. Thanks for watching.